So welcome, good morning again. Thank you for joining on our um, last PSC webinar session three on the private sector representative discussions on strengthening collaboration. So first, let me introduce myself. My name is Pachiri Boon Sakun Pitakpon, or MAM, the private sector engagement specialist on the SUFIA Local Capacity Development Project. Um, SUFIA LCD is a two-year project starting in 2020, and our project is working with two, this is to provide technical support to two regional um, partners, the Southeast Asian Fisheries Development Center, SUFDEC, and the Coral Triangle Initiatives on Coral Reefs, Fishery, Food Security, or CTI, CFF. Uh, over the past two years, we've been working to strengthen their organizational capacity, including private sector engagement activities. So the project is um, implemented by RTI International. And my apologies today, I have a slight cold sore throat, so I'm trying my best. If my volume drops or I'm not clear, just let me know. But before I go on, let me please introduce my colleague um, and co-moderator for this morning, Mr. Joey Ped. Pedrajas from Sufia TS. Joey? Good morning. Uh, I am Joey Pedrajas, a regional technical team member of the Sustainable Fish Asia Project. I am based in Iloilo, Philippines. I serve as the Regional Sustainable Fisheries Management, Coastal Law Enforcement, and Maritime Security Specialist of Sufia TS. Um, Sufia TS is an activity funded by USAID Regional Development Mission for Asia and implemented by Tetratech. SOFIA TS is implemented in the uh, uh, started in November 2021 and will end in November 2025. Through SOFIA TS, USAID works to promote sustainable fisheries and marine biology conservation in Indo Pacific region, um, addressing their inequality for slavery and for slavery concerns. The project covers the 10 ASEAN states plus the uh, six members of city six countries including Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste, and Solomon Island. So PTS promotes leadership and goals of regional organizations that advance sustainable fisheries management and counter IUU fishing. We focus on regional efforts for fisheries regulatory frameworks, improvement, adoption of fair labor and sustainable fisheries practices and support enhanced regional communication and outreach. Sophia TS provides um, support to cultivate and foster the role of private sector, recognizing that private sectors have important roles and are vital to bring success on these regional efforts. I am happy to be your co-moderator today. And once again, good morning. Thanks, Joey. <clears throat> so please now let me introduce our guest speakers and how we would do the session this morning. So in the first hour, we will have two guest speakers. First, let me introduce Ms. Cherry Marillon, founder and lead innovator at Kawil.ai. The second speaker is Mr. Farid Aslam, C <coughs> sorry, CEO and co-founder of Aruna. And then after the first two guest speakers, We'll be opening up for discussions and Q&A with everyone. So we hope you will join in the discussions then. Then in the second hour, we will have the other two guest speaker. Um, first is Ms. Juliet Alemani, um, PhD and country manager at data scientists at Ferragora Asia. And then followed by Mr. Tran Van Hao, assistant to the chairman of the Vietnam Tuna Association. And then after their two presentations, we'll open up for Q&A. So I highly encourage everyone to join in all the discussions and make note of your questions to ask our guest speaker. So without our further ado, um, let's start with Ms. Cherry. Yeah, uh, hi, good morning. Hi. Uh, yes. Uh, just give us uh, a I have minutes. some yes slides. So yes, yeah. So today I will be sharing with uh, people here our perspective to how to strengthen the collaboration with private sectors like us and with government agencies and NGOs in the fisheries management. So. Yeah, we are Kawil AI, uh, an industry agnostic artificial intelligence solution with customized computer vision tools that can be integrated into web and mobile application. Next slide. 
So as mentioned, I'm the founder, lead innovator of Gawil AI. So I, I'm, uh, I have several a few years of experience in doing uh, environmental management, especially on coral reef management uh, for quite some time. So uh, from the academia, so we manage marine biodiversity and conservation. So uh, overall, our mission is to help humanities understand artificial intelligence and our vision is to provide AI solutions to preserve biodiversity, livelihood, and environment with reliable and unbiased data analytics on demand. And our solution is based on or addresses the sustainable development goals number nine for infrastructure and innovation and SDG number 12, responsible consumption and production, and SDG, SDG number 14, life below water. So yes, next slide. So as we know, seafood traceability is a complicated maze process. So it involves a lot of different actors that often results also to IUU fishing because of the bureaucratic system and limiting policies. And for us, our traceability system is uh, implemented in three main components. So we focus on location, produce type or species, and logistics or uh, delivery of products. So the main actors for this seafood traceability and documentations, the documentation are the fishermen, processors or exporters, and consumers. So that's what we identified as the key data uh, elements. So this is uh, how the supply chain uh, happens, despite of the social status and needs and the maze that we are really trying to overcome. So in the Philippines, uh, we are focusing more on the municipal, municipal fisheries and aquaculture uh, combined market, which is 52% of the overall fisheries uh, supply in the Southeast Asian region alone. So we are currently having this initiative for electronic catch documentation and traceability, which is to reduce IUU fishing, of course. Uh, this will also impact labor opportunities in the local level if fisheries management are enhanced in the near future. So next slide. So last 2019, uh, Kawil AI has participated in several uh, hackathons of the USAID oceans and one was in uh, Thailand and the other one in Bali. We, we, we presented uh, initially our solution, the idea, and like having it validated as we move forward. So the tool that we have already developed is what we call Trace AI. So it is traceability access for consumers and exporters powered by artificial intelligence, which is an automated electronic catch documentation and traceability system, which has a mobile and web application, which was also pilot tested last 2019 with the WWF to the sustainability program in Mamborao and Sablayan Occidental Mindoro, which has over 253 registered participants. So the overall system is very simple. It's a scan, snap, and send for the mobile application. And for brokers, they need to register their fishermen through the uh, web application. So uh, they, uh, the overall catch of this system is we already register and documented the fishermen under the broker side to have them comply with the uh, municipal requirement. So all they need to do is really uh, take the data using the, the mobile application. So it is also automatically transferred to the web application once uh, connection is established. Uh, 
in the port. So auto cache recording, no need to have uh, data all throughout the process or what we call internet connection. So they, it, can, uh, it utilizes the local mobile access. So the Trace AI also has a marketplace, which, was, uh, which is currently funded by the Department of Science and Technology here in the Philippines which also uh, enhance the, the logistics side of traceability. As we know, uh, once the, the, the seafood or the fish has been transported, uh, that's where the traceability kind of cuts the connection. But in our system, we already uh, proposed a uh, from catch to plate uh, system. So, uh, the implementation of the marketplace is uh, being uh, tested uh, as of these uh, months. So next slide. So this is our, our feedback. Uh, I'm sharing our feedback last month uh, with regards to the users of our system. So as we know, as, as we have uh, gathered, there's a 100% uh, Kind of acceptance of the electronic cash documentation. Although this is the first time most of them use a mobile application to record their catch or their fish, fish data. So as we know, uh, everyone or most of the people right now are already using uh, Android devices or smartphones. And uh, the, the main purpose of this uh, feedback is to really get the initial acceptance or uh, availability of electronic devices for mobile users and also baseline data of how the, the ground or the fishermen uh, do their activity and they have this device on their, uh, ready on hand. So it also validated that uh, the fishermen are, are also keen in using electronic documentation given the availability of the system or the mobile application. Although uh, this is not really conclusive because uh, yeah, we have very low respondent right now in, in the Philippines, but uh, the, the pilot is uh, continuously uh, being done until August of this year. So next slide. So our initiative, as we move forward, we look at uh, our aim is to really create a database that can be accessed openly for data training to help increase the AI accuracy for tools that can be uh, utilized for traceability and on uh, electronic touch documentation. And second also, as, uh, as we know, uh, most of our fishermen are afraid to really use uh, gadgets or mobile devices because uh, they find it a bit expensive, but we're looking at really having it uh, on a cheaper version of a mobile application. So uh, right now uh, our system runs on Android 6. So it's, it's more on the earlier, earlier version of Android. So uh, yeah, we made it more affordable for our fishermen to have the access on their mobile phone. So uh, on the third is really an integrated collaboration between research and also the government entities. Because as we know, uh, technology and AI integration is a bit tedious and expensive. And private sectors like us uh, need support from, from uh, government also and NGOs and other uh, agencies to have the, a fully developed system. Next slide. So for the community collaboration, we have already validated uh, that fisher, fishermen or fisher folks are keen on using technology. And we are looking at utilizing the data that we are gathering to establish their uh, credit scoring or financial or have a financial support. And also, as I mentioned, uh, we want to address the hardware side of the 
uh, usability of the electronic catch do documentation. And lastly also is to really have them understand the value of the data that they are collecting. Because uh, most of our Fisher folks uh, think that uh, it is an extra job for them to gather the data using devices. But if they know that that data will help them really improve, improve the market and also the system, uh, they will have, they'll be more keen on using electronic uh, system. Uh, I think I have the last slide. So yeah, lessons learned is uh, all throughout the process from 2019 and up currently, uh, regular consulta consultation is needed to have a better uh, understanding of, on the micro level or the micro needs of our Fisher folks to really help them and address their constraint in the overall IUU uh, prevention. And also, uh, we, uh, we are looking at really having the testing on uh, small parts so that we get uh, a feedback, uh, what we call agile uh, management. So we get to improve as quick as possible. And also, we want to have referral a method like here uh, that they, uh, there is a technology already available for uh, sectors, government sectors and other government agencies that they can avail and really utilize or maybe kind of modify or customize according to their needs. So uh, really, uh, we are really looking forward to forge uh, collaboration and uh, partnership for a vet better implementation of solution, especially on the technology adoption. So yeah, uh, last slide is we are Kawil AI. We bring AI technology from lab to life. So here is our contact. So yeah, hit us an email or a uh, message. Thank you. Thank you, Cherry. Thank you so much. So before we take any questions, let's go to Mr. Ferd from Aruna and have his presentation, then we'll open for both questions for to Cherry and Mr. Ferry. Yeah, thank you, mom. Yes. Um, okay. Okay, um, yeah, let me start the presentation from me. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Farid from Aruna. Uh, I would like to share about what uh, kind of activity that we are doing in Indonesia and how we collaborate uh, each with other organization to improve the uh, fisheries in Indonesia to be more transparent, transparent and also sustainable. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the brief introduction about the organization itself. We are a tech company uh, in Indonesia, based in Indonesia, focusing in marine and fisheries sector. What we are doing uh, is we're focusing how to make a better livelihood for the community itself, not only for the fishermen, but also the sustainability of the environment and also uh, uh, the profit for the company also. So we focus on the people, planet, and profit things. That's, that's become our main concept in the fishery sector. Uh, next slide. So we established in 2016, our main focus uh, is to tackle the supply chain problem, uh, especially in the seafood uh, distribution in Indonesia. So uh, we see a lot of problem here, like in inefficient supply chain, few data collection, and also bad quality control. Uh, that implement by our uh, traditional fishermen. So that's the one that we want to tackle and we want to focus in. Uh, and then we create the solution within our company itself. So next slide. So this is what we are doing. We're building a supply chain uh, aggregator platform for, for the seafood product. So we connect um, and we, we guarantee the demand for the fishermen community and also fish farmer community in Indonesia. We connect with the seafood distributor overseas and also domestic market like the processing company, uh, food services company and the others. So we secure the demand first uh, from this um, organization and company. Uh, from that uh, demand and then we put on our aggregator platform and then we distribute uh, all the demands of our fishermen and fish farmer partner uh, for them uh, to get an access uh, and option for the market. So uh, we, uh, we organize the community of fishermen and fish farmer uh, in many areas in Indonesia and we standardize and building 
a facility that we call it the fisherman hub. So this fisherman hub uh, has a function to become like mini processing plant and then to become a, a inventory and stock and warehouse uh, called a simple cold chain facility there and become a community hub where the fishermen can meet together and do uh, many activity together with the community and also with our people, with our employees. So the next slide. So this is what we are doing with the community. Uh, so we built a community of fishermen that consists of this structure. Uh, so we employ uh, a people that we call it local heroes, uh, that they are become our employee that manage the fishermen group. So these local heroes, the one that use our apps. Previously, we tried to make the fishermen to use our apps, uh, mobile apps, but it doesn't work because the fishermen only focus uh, how to catch the fish when we give them the mobile phone sometimes they they didn't use it even they they give it to their wife or they they even sold it so that's why uh, we create this mechanism where uh, the local heroes become the group manager the one that use our apps and the one that collect the daily data for the fisherman activity like daily transaction uh fisherman with us and then uh, the stock and also their profile uh, and and everything uh, and then uh, the other structure is the fisherman itself. They're focusing on the production activity, and we train them how to implement sustainable and responsible fishing, how to implement the quality control based on the demand that we already have, and we give to them. And then uh, we train another things like financial management once they already get a stable income from us. And then another uh, things that we also uh, add to the structure is the community of women. Mostly they act like uh, the processor uh, to do sizing and grading on our hub. So sometimes they do the cutting, uh, they package the, the fish that catch by the fisherman before it's sent to the our, uh, our large processing partner or directly shipped to our customer. Uh, next. So this is the hubs looks like uh, that we built uh, in Indonesia. Currently, we have more than 120 hubs that we built uh, from all location in, in Indonesia. This is like a small house, small mini warehouse, and also mini processing facility. Uh, the main function is to become the transaction point where we do the transaction with the fishermen, and then we store the fish in good cold chain quality. And after that, well, well the transaction uh, occur in daily basis and we can improve uh, the income of the fishermen. We open an access, we collaborate with other organizations like the banking institution, financial institution, or other startups that are focusing on the financial services to provide loan uh, insurance and saving mechanism for the fishermen, for our fishermen. And then we also built now the input store uh, that we call it Aruna Kios, where we can uh, solve cheaper pricing uh cheaper pricing for the tools that needed by the fishermen to do the pro, uh, production activity and another thing that we implement is several things like iot devices tracking devices and also the uh, solar panel in in uh, several areas that didn't have a good electricity uh, next yeah this is the one that we collaborate with other organization on our hub so when we build our hub it's become a community hub where the fishermen gather together and do the transaction with us and it's open opportunity for them to collaborate or to get an access for other partners so we open the financing uh, partnership uh, with with step on bank peer to -peer, uh, fintech uh, peer to peer partner and also insurance company here to give insurance to the fishermen to give loan to the fishermen itself to increase the productivity and the other things that we launch our uh, store that so, uh, sell fishing gear, fishing equipment, fuel, and daily needs with a cheaper price because we collect in daily basis their transaction data in monthly basis what how many fishing gear they need and fuel and the others. So this is the one that we uh, uh, provide to our fishermen and we open to the partner to, to collaborate and to give the service through our fishermen through this hub. Next. Yeah, this is several activity. Uh, I just want to uh, show a quick uh, overview. Uh, so next slide, this is the activity on our hub. Um, yeah, this is what kind of training we train the fishermen and also the local women to do the uh, as a mini processing activity. And next slide. And this is the looks of our fishermen and fishermen looks like. Mostly we're working with the small scale fishermen. Indonesia, 90% of fishermen is small scale. 
and also we also working with the peace farmer traditional peace farmer too so we we, we both working with the fishermen and also peace farmer in, in indonesia uh, next and this is the one that i mentioned previously about the iot tracking devices for this we are not working alone we are working with other organization like global fishing watch uh, and other organization due to providing the iot tracking devices so we put the tracking devices on the fishing boat and then we record uh, the fishing activity in daily basis and we can provide this information to our customer uh, so several of our customer are giving incentive uh, to us and our uh, fishermen uh, if we can give this information to them so this is the one that we implement uh, still in not all locations uh, in several locations but our target is to uh, improve on our location that we have uh, so this is the one that we already done with our fishermen and next and this is the activity with the local uh, uh, community too. We do a training with them next. And then this is um, uh, the community development, the gathering with the fishermen looks like. Uh, this, we do always like manually get gathering with the fishermen to get the feedback from them uh, and next. And this is the current activity that we have. Uh, we already covered like uh, 120 now, uh, based on the latest uh, data. And we have like 26,000 fishermen all over Indonesia. We already covered uh, uh, big island uh, in Indonesia. Now, uh, this year we targeted to have 200 uh, location and next year is 400 location. And we already covered more than 20 uh, plus commodity, uh, like lobster uh, and then tuna, stream, crab, and the other type of commodity next so this is the commodity that our fishermen partners uh, produce currently and we do both for export and also for the domestic distribution for this one uh, next and this is what we are doing uh, the ecosystem collaboration aruna focus to aggregate the supply and aggregate the demand uh, but on the mid level uh, we need to collaborate with the current industry uh, so there is several product that need to be processed before it, it gets to our customers. So what we are doing is we do the partnership with the industry player like manufacturer, fish processing. So from our side, uh, we help them to access uh, for the continuity of the supply and we can provide them the market. So they, they just focus on the manufacturing side and increase the productivity and efficiency. And we can also provide several services like we can provide the technology itself uh, like the platform, uh, the application to improve their operation. Uh, next slide. And this is also the collaboration that we do with the e-commerce during the coffee situation. We do direct distribution and we provide this uh, collaboration so the, the retail customer can buy directly from this e-commerce platform, uh, directly from our fishermen. Next. And this is uh, the last part uh, that we also do the, the some improvement on sustainability initiative, like focusing on improve the livelihood, uh, 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 monitoring the fish stock, and also make the resources sustainable. Next. So this is the several things that we do. We do a daily gathering and we do like a prevention uh, concept that we uh, convert the fishing gear of the fishermen to be more eco-friendly fishing gear. So we make a program for that and we create a conservation activity in monthly basis. We do like beach clean up or we can plant mangrove. Uh, that's uh, in monthly activity on our uh, uh, community and also the adaptation. So we implement like zero waste hub on our mini plan and also Impact combining the uh, wild catch with aquaculture and implement some some uh, uh, sustainable energy sources like solar panel and also the other things. Next, and this is uh, what we are uh, what we already done with several partners. So to implement all of this program, we uh, we do the collaboration with the private sector, NGO, microfinancing, and also in the Indonesian government. There's a lot of program in terms of capacity building. Uh, giving a grant to our fishermen that coming from the government institution to a lot of ministry to the partnership with us regarding to the sustainability and improving the uh, the livelihood of the fishermen. Uh, next. Uh, okay, I think that's uh, that's uh, uh, the, the presentation for me. Uh, uh, maybe we can continue on the question if, if any from you uh, and I can explain more on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ferret. Yeah. It's really an incredible model that Aruna has set up for Indonesia. I know I've, you know, working on this project for the past year, we did a regional assessment. And I think this kind of platform is something that many countries are looking for to have something similar like this in their country. 
So yes, let's open up for discussions from with the participants. So you could ask any questions to either Cherry and or Mr. Ferd. And actually we have already one question from John in the chat to Cherry about, let's see. Da, 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 question one, has Kawil.ai been approached by BFAR PH Coast Guard National Police regarding the application of AI technology and digital fisheries traceability data to support maritime domain awareness and security issues? And then if such applicant, if the application seems particularly relevant for the West Philippine Sea, and for monitoring the EZZ zones. Yes. Uh, thank you for the question, John, and really listening to my presentation. Uh, we, we, our approach is more on a municipal level, so municipal and provincial level. So we have, uh, it's not uh, an agreement yet, but we have a, 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 go, a go, a go signal with the a provincial BFAR, to implement our system in the uh, province level. But we are eyeing also as uh, part of our enhancement is to go on a regional side or the central side implementation. And also, as mentioned, uh, there were uh, several discussions also applying AI for, for management in the West Philippine Sea. There are several NGOs that also approach us if we can do it, but uh, uh, right now, uh, it's the strong uh, clamor for it is not yet there, because as as we know, uh, it's a step by step. Also, when we do those uh, uh, security side of management and all, so yeah, we are working uh, towards uh, implementing it on a central basis here in the Philippines and also in the export uh, zone in the West Philippine Sea. And yeah, actually working on testing it in the, if there are uh, partners here that uh, will kind of help us really uh, do the testing on the West Philippine Sea, that would be a great opportunity for us. So yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Cherry. So I have a question from Mr. Bin from WWF Vietnam. Please go ahead and ask. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for Ferry. Um, such an amazing presentation. I am so glad that, uh, ma'am, you're you're recording this because I need yes. to go yeah. back <laughs> and really watch because I feel like this app is so comprehensive. Um, mm. It really is mind blowing that to see Ferry first from the fishermen to local to the business to well, basically everything. It really is mind blowing. Um, I just have a really quick question. I guess it's not really about the, the private um, sector engagement, but Ferit, I, I heard you mention that the fishermen uh, weren't used to the app, uh, so they, they weren't really happy or, or comfortable using the app. So then you ask the local people uh, at that fish uh, fishing communities to, to help uh, the fishermen with? Can, can you elaborate on that? So do the, the local people, when the fishermen uh, go back to the port uh, and then they have all the cash data and so on, and then the local people will go on the boat and then enter those data for, for them because we're having the same problem. So but thank you very much, that's all. Great question. So Mr. Ferg? Yeah, okay, thank you, uh, Ben. Uh, that's uh, a great question. So that's that's the, the main learning that we uh, learn from, from our uh, validation to uh, to Indonesian fishermen. So at first, our idea is to create a, uh, an app that can be used by the fishermen, and then after that, we can connect them with the customer, but it doesn't work because at the time, most of the fishermen in Indonesia is already old enough, like uh, they're like 50 years old or, or later or, or even, more than that. So they didn't um, comfortable to use the apps at the time, even uh, use a smartphone while they do the fishing activity. Uh, so we already have, even we give a grant to them like a free uh, smartphone at the time, but they didn't use it. Like I mentioned previously, sometimes they, they just sold it to get money for their daily activity, <laughs> or they give it to their wife or their children uh, to use it. So it doesn't work. So that's why, um, what we are doing, we, we try to make a mechanism. Uh, so we recruit the local people, the young people uh, that, that may be more adaptable to use the apps. So these young people, we call it local heroes. 
because you want to create an idea, these local people become the heroes of the fishermen. So they are the one that become the hub of information for them. So this local heroes uh, has an age between 20 to 35 years old. We uh, prioritize the local people who is living there, but sometimes there is very remote area in Indonesia that we cannot rely on the local people, uh, local young people there, because most of the local young people move to other area. So we uh, like we we recruit uh, the young people from other area to to stay on that area and to become the local heroes. So that's the case. So the idea is that these young people, the one that use the apps and the one that become the manager of the community like the community manager. So they will stay there. Uh, so that's why we prioritize the local people and they live and do the activity uh, uh, on the fishing hubs uh, that I showed previously on the, uh, on the slide. Because the, another problem when we're providing market to the fishermen is, is the cold chain uh, facility. In Indonesia, there is not much cold chain facility on the first mile, uh, like the nearest one that, that near the fishing port. Uh, so that's the one that very limited only available on the bigger city, but on the remote area is not available. So that's why we're not only providing this structure of organization with the local heroes, but install the uh, the mini warehouses. Uh, once we already get the fish, we can uh, put on our mini warehouses that already implement the simple cold chain. Sometimes it's not like a, a big cold storage. It's just like a small chiller with the ice and something like that before it's sent to the bigger cold storage. So, uh, so that's the learning that we already done until now. And another point that these apps only collect the transaction data. Another point at, that we need to collect the traceability data. Uh, the, the first idea also uh, how to use the smartphone while doing the fishing activity. It's also not valid uh, for now, uh, based on the all activity that we do in, in, in many locations. So that's why we come up the idea with the tracking devices, the IoT devices that can they can passively collect data. So we just implement these devices. These devices can record the movement of the boat, the GPS movement. So from this GPS movement, the fisherman doesn't do anything. Uh, they just need to, uh, we just need their permission to put these devices on their boat and then it will record all the, um, uh, the fishing activity, the moving of the boat. So uh, the movement of the boat, the fishing zone location will be recorded on the devices and the type of the fish and the sizing, grading, everything will be recorded after they landed the fish on our hub. So that's the mechanism that currently we are doing and we implement. Even in many locations, it's not directly we can implement the app. Sometimes we still need to use like a spreadsheet uh, because sometimes uh, uh, the, the local people, the local heroes uh, need training before we use the mobile app. So we create this uh, face, not directly use the app. Sometimes in, in other locations, we use spreadsheet before it's convert to use uh, in apps in full uh, uh, process. So another point that uh, I also uh, highlight is the cap capability of the activity. It's not like sophisticated things. It's mostly like a data collection form. But the, the main thing is how these apps can work in offline situation. So that's why uh, on the architecture of the apps, we call it like offline first. So sometimes there is no data network, uh, the apps can record offline the data. And when there is a small uh, network, it can synchronize uh, to our server, uh, 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 main server. So, so that's the idea, not creating like sophisticating, the easiest one uh, um, and not creating the so many inputs model to the fisherman. It's only automatic using IoT and not many form, and it can work in offline situation. So that's that's the one that we implement now. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Fur. Yeah. So we got more questions. So an another one for from Alex to both Cherry and Farid. Were there any surprises or interesting discoveries that surprised you with the technology adoption from working with the fishermen and their community? Anything surprising? Yeah, maybe I go first. Okay. So yeah, uh, well, uh, the reason why we really focus on uh, technology adoption on the level of the fishermen is uh, when I, I did a survey way back 2019 in, in an island uh, in the Visayas region, it's Sikihor. Uh, we're kind of mapping the coral reef and uh, we rented a boat and along the, 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 the survey, uh, we saw our fishermen, uh, the boat is owned by the fishermen, by the way, uh, uh, kind of browsing on his mobile phone mm. and looking at and watching some, you know, YouTube 
uh, entertainment as he waits as we do the survey uh, on the reef. So I said to myself, hey, they know how to use the a mobile uh, phone and like a smartphone. So why not utilize it for their benefit? So that's that's the idea that really sparked in my mind. And it's really something that understanding how it works and not, not really that they don't know. They know how to use it in a certain level, but how they can utilize it in other applications. I do believe that they're also open to learning it. So yeah, that's the, my this, uh, unusual discovery of really how fishermen uh, enjoy themselves out in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cherry. I, I am interested, Ma'am Cherry, on you have mentioned about scaling up the initiative at the regional level. Um, I am interested on what are the challenges you have foreseen in scaling up this initiative, and um, is there any um, is there any mechanisms you have thought to address this one? Uh, yes, number one challenge. Maybe uh, Farid and I also uh, share that same constraint uh, with the adoption because. One, uh, people are resistant in technology or using devices. But so as I mentioned, it's a process that we need to educate them first. And even on the uh, government side, uh, their use of the old method of really uh, putting it into their uh, log, log sheet and so on. And they say that, uh, oh, we don't have connection here and something like that. So uh, as we discovered, as we move forward, those are the main constraints on our stakeholder side. And yes, and going regional in the level of uh, more on uh, management and uh, like monitoring the, the special zone, uh, of course, uh, funding is also needed on really going there and really doing in the data gathering or really implementing the whole system. So it, uh, our system is, uh, can be implemented offline, but then again, uh, de deploying people going there to do the data gathering and the validation needs uh, support. So that's the main uh up until now we're really trying hard to uh meet uh both ends <laughs> so yeah okay so um sherry thank you i think on this point i see that the chat box have exploded with like three questions and i think i wanted to just summarize a uh, question asking about how does your systems ensure that the cot is sustainable or it can, can certify the sustainability of the catch. And then we have a questions about, for the Aruna specifically on the financial services, how are the fishermen doing on repaying back their loans? And then we had a question uh, for both of your systems, does the data get reported to the government? Is it synchronized to the local government database? And then how does it link up? And so, yeah, I think, I. And does the government, I guess, approach you for the data is what they're asking. So is your systems linking up to the national governmental database or how does that work? So who wants to go first? <laughs> okay, maybe from, from me uh, okay. this time. Yeah, okay, thank you. So I would like to answer the question about the ensure the sustainability uh, um, production. So um, that's that's uh, one of the main concern of Aruna. We want to uh, 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 implement the sustainability fishing activity in Indonesia. So, but it's not like a one-time job where we can convert all the people uh, to implement that uh, that kind of activity. So, what we are doing is we always uh, try to get what they need first before we can offer another things that we can standard like standardize them uh, like uh, training them to sustainability so it's it's happened the first time when we come to do fishing activity we ask what they want sometimes uh, in terms of technology they, they 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 answer like they need like 
ada device that can show them where the fishing zone location, the one that they, they can uh, find uh, uh, a big fish uh, on the ocean. So that's what they say. Uh, and then we try to giving them that kind of feature. And then when they when we already creating them, creating that feature, they didn't use it because they say that they, they, they cannot use smartphone while while do the fishing activity. So so sometimes what they want it's something that they really need. So and then we do the observation. What they really need uh, that that they think is very important is the income for their family. So we tap into the the demand creation. So that's why what we offer to them is not as a tech company at first. What we offer to them is we can provide them better transparent market uh, and better pricing by uh, uh, simplifying the supply chain. So that's what we offer to them: better pricing while well, simplify the supply chain, and then we can give them more income from that point. Uh, they they can change uh, the habit uh, because we say to them if they want to keep the relationship they need to standardize their activity like the quality uh, and then the type of the commodity and also the sustainability even for now for Aruna we put our people there on site from 120 location there is one or two local heroes that ensure the PC activity there already uh, uh, use our standard and the second things um, this fisherman we create a level. There is like level one, level two, level three, and level four. And different level have different incentive, different rewards. Like the first thing, and in level one, the fishermen only need to do the registration. They register their national identity to us. They register their uh, fishing gear profiling and everything for them to start the transaction with us. The second level is they implement the uh, quality standard and the, the consistency of the supply. And the third level, after they already stand, uh, standardize the quality and the uh, production, they standardize the sustainability. And then the last level that is they can standardize the income. So we want uh, have the fishermen to improve step by step. And while they do the improvement, we give them the, the incentive, like the one that can hand, that can have an access to micro loan as the one that already reach the level three. The one that already implement the quality standard and also sustainability standard, they can have an access to the micro loan at the cheaper uh, from the other option. And also the one that can get like the uh, the rewards, the, the loyalty points, it's, it's the one on the level three and level four. So that's what Aruna trying to do, uh, to make them to change their habit. And we ensure that they can implement step by step the sustainability standard and also the quality standard. So uh, that's the main thing on the sustainability level. And we are on, also on progress now with our team. We have our own director that focusing on the sustainability. One of the founder become director of sustainability that want to certify and implement the sustainability policy on all the location that we have. Now we are on, on progress to register our MSC certification uh, in several location. On the other things, uh, the second question on the uh, loan repay, uh, repayment. So uh, all the transaction between the fishermen uh, and and within our ecosystem is we pay the fishermen uh, in 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 daily basis based on their production to us. So uh, the fishermen it income come from us. So if the uh, the financing partner give a loan to the fishermen, we can cut uh, uh, from the income that they should get in 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 daily basis from us. So like if, if they get a hundred USD uh, in in monthly basis or in, in per transaction, we can cut like uh, ten USD for the repayment and the other. So we can become uh, integration with, with with the financing institution. And just I mentioned previously, we, we cannot give to loan to all fishermen. The one that only comply with the standard and on the higher level that can access the uh, the loan. So that that's the strategy that we already create. The problem now that. There is so many. When we open this opportunity to so, so many parties, so many financial institutions and banks want to give loan to our fishermen. Now the problem is we didn't have enough resources because our local heroes focusing to become the community manager. And if they add new, new, new tasks to providing the loan, uh, uh, loan service to our fishermen, it will increase their uh, job load. Uh, their workload. So, so that's become a problem now. Now we try to increase our uh, organization cap capacity uh, to help the fishermen to access the loan from our partner before we can scaling up the, the partnership on the financing aspect. And the last thing about the government integration. So yes, uh, there is several locations that we already integrate the data with the government, but not directly us to the government. Uh, we, we, we working with several NGO uh, like Global Fishing Watch, Global Fishing Watch is the one that do the monitoring of the fishing activity uh, in, in many regions, including in, in, in Indonesia. 
and we do the partnership with them. And the government of Indonesia have a, a partnership and, and uh, um, uh, agreement with Global Fishing Watch to access their data. So, um, so that's that's where we 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 providing the data to government by working with the NGO. They focusing on that monitoring data. We provide the data to them, and then they do the a partnership with the government. So it, it's happened in several locations, not all not all location, but we we have a intensive uh, communication with the government how we can uh, scaling up this this partnership uh, uh, in in many locations. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's the the question for me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry very comprehensive. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry? yeah, I I can add to yeah government uh, access. Uh, just uh, just uh, mentioned uh, we already have uh, municipal and provincial users in the bar level uh, because uh, there there is a mandate uh, on the national but uh, local governments have their own mandates on IUU and. Uh, so their their local uh, territories are the first one to implement uh, IUU fishing on that level. That's why we approach it on the uh, municipal and provincial level. And uh, yes, uh, we are really working on the national level right now. And really, our goal on the third week of our 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 third quarter of this year is to have it. Uh, tested on the national level uh, on the big part side and uh, uh, compliance with the uh, traceability and electronic catch documentation based on the euro compliance because our, our platform or the, the data that we collect is based on the euro compliance for tuna and uh, blue swimming crab. So uh, we are currently updating other uh, in, uh, KDE for the for the for the compliance of other export uh, species, but right now uh, we are focused on the tuna, uh, blue swimming crab, and grouper as our export uh, compliance uh, certification. So uh, we are looking really uh, forward to really implement it on a national level. And our platform, by the way, for, for the government is free. We are not charging the government for the usage of the platform. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have two more questions in the chat come up. One first one to Mr. Farid is of the 120 or so sites, what are the most dominant wild capture fish, fish species, I guess that's what they're asking, that are included in the Aruna system? And then another question from Dr. Nora, I guess, to both of you about data ownership and the, the role, uh, how to say, it, the role that the fact that the fishermen are actually data collectors and about their data ownership and being recognized for their contribution. Yeah, uh, I would like to answer the first question about uh, the most dominant world capture mm. of this series. So from that uh, type of commodity, currently we have more than 20, but the most dominant one, uh, the first one is uh, blue swimming crab. Uh, blue swimming crab is the, the first commodity that we first focusing on. So that's the one that become the, the main um, location, like more than 50 location uh, that we built, uh, the fishermen produce the blue swimming crab. And uh, the second one currently is the lobster. So the lobster is also the second one. And the third one is um, a grouper, demersal fish, grouper, snapper. And the fourth is uh, the pelagic fish, like tuna. Um, so uh, that's, the, that's the, the top commodity that we have currently. Uh, blue swimming crab, lobster, grouper, snapper, and tuna. And for, for the fish farmer, because it, it's land basis, it, it's mostly stream. But for the wild catch, it's that four type of species that we currently have. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, another question about the data uh, ownership, right? Um, mm. yeah. yeah, okay. So for the data ownership, uh, we divided um, and also the permission, the data permission from the fishermen. So we, we divided between traceability data and the other data that needed uh, to do the partnership with other parties like the financing partner. So for traceability data, what we are doing with them that when we start the, the partnership with them, we ask their permission that we will use the traceability data for our customers. So that's the first thing. But uh, on the other hand, we give incentive to them. 
So when we implement the traceability data, uh, that's on the fisherman on the level three, where they implement the sustainability guidance. Of course, when they, they implement that, they will, give, they, they will get incentive. Like we implement the access to financing, the incentive that we call it the loyalty point, uh, that every data they collect, we will convert them to become the loyalty point. This loyalty point can be changed uh, to become a goods on our Aruna kiosk. Like I present previously, there is like Aruna kiosk that's selling the fishing equipment store. So they can mm. change the loyalty point to get the fishing equipment on our uh, store. So that's that, that's some kind of incentive that we give to them. And for the financing aspect, uh, we always ask them because we have all their transaction data. Uh, the, the financing partner <laughs> needs the, this data uh, to do the credit scoring. So when a fisherman already aware they want to uh, propose the loan to our financing partner, we will ask them that we will provide this data uh, based on their permission to our financing partner. If they're okay, we will continue the activity. If not, we, we cannot uh, continue the partnership with the banking. So that's the one that we uh, uh, divided the, 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 the data ownership or not. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I think last, yeah. last one minute for, for my... <laughs> Uh, for the data uh, uh, here in the Philippines, we are still establishing the data bank for, for fishermen or the fisheries sector. And that's why I, I mentioned in my presentation that our, our, our initiative really is to have the data, uh, data bank for, for fishermen to utilize it for their loans and uh, fundings or support because uh, they're not aware that they're holding a valuable data and supplying that data to, to everyone. So we need to really educate them, to tell them that you supply data, you get this. You have the opportunity to have your uh, uh, loan approved via your transaction in our, our system. So uh, we are still on the first part. And yeah, uh, I think even though, uh, this is really a very uh, new initiative in our uh, country. Uh, we're looking really to uh, push the, the, the adoption on the regional level also, because uh, the fisheries sector in the Philippines are left behind, especially on, on the technology and uh, valuing the market. So that's our really focus this year. Hopefully we can really establish the, the groundworks. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Cherry and Ferd. I hope you'll stay around for round two. But I think at this point in time, I would like to move on to our next two guest speakers. So first, let's start with Juliet from Paragoya, please. Hi, nice to have everyone today. Um, maybe I'll start with a few words about myself. Uh, mm -hmm. So my name is Juliet. I am from this tiny little island called Reunion next to Madagascar. And I grew up surrounded by fisheries, but also sugarcane uh, industry. Um, I have an engineering diploma in agriculture and aquaculture, specialized in data modeling. I also completed a PhD in um, stock assessment for fisheries. And I then joined Ferragora Asia first as a data scientist and stepwise I became a country manager within this consulting company. So now maybe a little bit about Ferragora Asia. So you can go to the next slide. Sorry. Yes, and the next one. So we are a consulting company. Uh, we've been around for six years now. Uh, what we do first is to provide uh, expert advisory services. Uh, we work a lot with scientific methodologies to provide data analysis, data collection, and ensure that we have better transparency and traceability within supply chains. Uh, we focus a lot on data confidentiality because of course, with all these data collection, uh, we have to respect and be compliant with European regulations. Uh, and we make sure that we convey all informations within all the nodes of the supply chain. So within Fergora Asia, so when we started, uh, we didn't use any technology, but slowly we realized that when you have to, um, you have to analyze a, a lot of data, you need at a point some tools to support for certain projects. So we developed our own web and mobile application. 
uh, the objective was really to make it uh, user friendly with a mobile application, but stronger with a web application to have uh, you know, a, a good data analysis uh, tool and a good data storage tool as well. So what we did with Verificate is that we collected data with farmers, processing plants and buyers. Uh, we conducted data analysis and it helped us to have a full monitoring of the supply chain on the social, uh, the environmental and the production area. Once we have this whole mapping, it helps us to assess what are the main improvement areas uh, to achieve sustainable farming. So most of the time uh, we would use this app actually to support farmers when they want to get ready for a certain type of certification. So in sugarcane, it can be the bone sucrose standard. Uh, and in aquaculture uh, for ASC standard, we have a full alignment. So it's really like up to the farmers, like when, whenever they want to get ready, we support them with the data collection, with checking how they are aligned, uh, what is the room for improvement, and we also can provide the workshops when required. Next slide, please. So one of the main uh, approach we use is a cross-sector collaboration. And I think that's like, that's why we wanted to share a little bit today on our um, past uh, knowledge and past lessons learned. Next slide. So we are focusing right now on two main commodities, which are sugarcane and shrimp farming. Um, but one of the key points uh, within our company is that we are able to adapt methodologies to diverse commodities. Um, if we click to the next slide, so we work with a wide range of partners uh, and we always ensure that within each project we involve at the same time the private sector and NGOs and if possible the government uh, sectors as well. Uh, so in sugarcane, some of our main customers are Nestle, and uh, we worked in the past with PepsiCo as well. Uh, and we had a big project lately with USAID, so a counter trafficking in person project, where we worked on migrant workers issue within sugarcane sector. In aquaculture, uh, we work mainly with shrimp. Uh, some of our, our of some of the big NGOs we've worked with were WWF or ICO. We work with the standard ASC. We've worked in Vietnam, uh, so where we helped farmers to get ASC certified smallholder shrimp farmers. And we've worked in Thailand as well, uh, specifically with Thailand and ICO on the project to improve the sustainability of the shrimp farms. Um, so what we do here is that we really make sure that um, we collaborate. We are in the middle between like bigger companies and small farmers and NGOs. And we try to make sure that communication flows. Um, and our role, I would say, is to bring everyone to the table and drive change with everyone's specific skills. We go to the next slide. Yes, so a little bit more about our role. So we want to drive transparency. What we do there is that we make sure that we interact with all the nodes. And I think one of our a big strong point that we have is that we uh, combined this, this capacity to go on the ground, to connect with farmers, to have a good relationship with them, and the capacity uh, to analyze in-depth data, and the capacity to communicate these with uh, higher nodes of the supply chain, with the final buyers or the retailers. Uh, one of the big methodology that we've been adapting to several of our projects, whether it's in sugarcane or in shrimp farming, or it can be also in wild catch fisheries, um, is about environmental and social uh, automatic data analysis. So we have specific surveys that, um, that we elaborate with our partners. Um, and then we have coded algorithms that do the automatic risk mapping based on the survey's answers. Um, and these have proved to be extremely useful whenever you need to have a full risk mapping of many farmers. Uh, because once you have conducted your survey, if you don't have any tool to treat the data, uh, it's extremely time consuming for, you know, for human resources uh, to do all of this manually. So our automatic algorithms support this automatic risk analysis to have like an overview in one second of where, which are the farms that need more support in which categories. So typically for social areas uh, in our past USAID uh, projects, 
we have worked a lot on analyzing which farms had the main issues regarding child labor, for example, or which farms had the main issues regarding like not respecting minimum wage. And that helps to really target the workshops we provide afterwards. Um, when we provide these risk mapping, um, we also then carry out the training uh, and, and we make sure that either we do carry out our own, tra our own training or we involve WWF or other NGOs that are part of our project to carry out this training as well. Next slide, please. So um, a few points about strengthening partnerships. Yeah, so uh, I think I didn't want to focus my presentation on the technology we're offering and so on, because if, if you want to know more, we can schedule a call and I can send like demo video and so on. I wanted to focus a little bit on the lessons learned and the room for improvement. Um, so one of the things is that social change takes time. Uh, we worked a lot on like big social issues. And what we realized is that whenever we want to have a strong partnership, uh, you need to really ensure that you build the trust. And it does take time not only with the partners and NGOs, but also with the farmers. But longer partnerships means also higher impact. So I think this is what we need to seek. Um, another observation we had is that there's a lack of data sharing, even within the same company. Um, so sometimes with some of our clients, we realize that we have access to certain data that other parts of the company don't have access to. And it makes it really hard when we have to, you know, move on on the project if there's not enough uh, flow of data and information. Um, we also realize that social media becomes a key element when it comes to building trust and keeping the contact with the farmers and engaging them. So we are working more and more on our social media platforms uh, in, in Thai, because specifically in Thailand, right? Uh, and, and developing new strategies on this as well. Um, another lesson learned is that whenever we involve the, the NGOs uh, with, within our project, we realize that they have like very key uh, elements to bring that make us stronger. Uh, typically, we've worked when we worked with USAID, we learned a lot about social behavior change communication methodologies. And now we've been integrating it in our other projects. So it's very interesting to see how each of us have something to bring to the other. And next slide, please. Yeah. And um, key points about room for improvement. Um, so one point is, of course, the need to centralize the information. So our feeling is that sometimes different NGOs work on the same topic or same project of, of things that are very similar and that could involve the same methodology. So we feel that there's a need to really centralize this information and make sure that everyone is aware of who, which NGOs, which companies, which tech companies work on what, because that way we can make it more efficient. We can apply similar methodologies to the different projects. Um, typically, what we've been doing in automating uh, risk mapping with social and environmental data can be applied to any commodity, basically. I feel also that we need stronger collaboration with the government. Um, one, one of the challenges we've been facing is sometimes when we engage with the government, we, we feel there's more talking than doing, and, and we want things to go faster. Uh, we also feel like there's a need for the government to put certain laws in place and to change, modify the laws so that certain data collection become uh, mandatory. Uh, and finally, we need that there's an uh, important point on the continuity at the end of a project. So sometimes when we work with NGOs, it's like a project basis thing. And then at the end of the funding, everything stops. Uh, so it's important to involve also big private sector companies so that they can keep the project ongoing um, and make sure that we don't lose all the effort that has been done around farmers engagement, basically. Um, one, one of the things that we noticed also about like challenges for technology for this continuity of, of a project um, is that whenever we try to force too much things on farmers, it's, it's hard to make it work. So we're trying to uh, shift our focus and shift our mentality instead of trying and to push as much as possible farmers to change and all of them to adapt their, to technology, we're trying to ourselves as a consulting company to adapt and to offer various ways of collecting data. So not only mobile app, web app, but also having like phone calls or having like using line messengers uh, or paper base and then taking a picture and sending us a picture. 
because what we feel is that whenever it comes to technology, if we try really to like enforce just technology adoption and collecting all the data with technology, we risk to leave some farmers behind. And I think that's not the point. We need to be inclusive in our approaches. And I think I don't want to go too far, too, too far, so I'll, I'll okay. stop here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. So let us proceed with our last guest presenter, and then we'll open up for questions. So Mr. Howe from Vina Tuna, are you ready? Yes, thank you. Thank you, okay. Pima. OK, uh, good, good morning, everyone again. Uh, uh, my name is Howe from Vietnam Tuna Association. And thank you for Sufa Project. Uh, uh, give me this opp opportunity to sharing you some on the uh, private sector engagement uh, to strengthen the seafood traceability in Vietnam. And I will do more focus on the how, how we engage the private sector to strengthen the, our tuna traceability process in Vietnam. Next slide, please. I guess our, uh, our Vina Tuna, Vietnam Tuna Association, uh, we actually established in 2010. So now we are uh, 12 years old and uh, our function is covered for the whole country It's the national organization uh, actually we are focused working focus uh, on three provincial in the south of vietnam south central of vietnam uh, including khánh hoa binh Đinh, and phu yên province of vietnam uh, these three uh, uh, province is the, the the we can call the capital of tuna of vietnam in the south central part Next, next slide. So um, I would like to share some, some activity that we are in, engaging uh, our private sector to growing with our tuna industries on how to strengthen the, uh, our um, tuna traceability process uh, in Vietnam. The first thing that I would like to share that uh, our tuna industries now is under a FIP project and since 2016, we already developed uh, the the um, Vietnam Yellowfin to uh, fifth traceability to cost for our tuna products since um, 2016, and from that we also already revised and updated with many uh, contribution from the local tuna companies as well as this uh, activity we are in. Uh, coordination with WWF Vietnam. So on this uh, traceability code, we coding all the key data elements on our tuna products. Uh, by, by coding this, we can easily to recording to risk that information for traceability, traceability purposes. And at this time, we have 27 local tuna processors are joining our a program for the fifth uh, FIP program and applied uh, yeast uh, FIP traceability course in Vietnam. And for those of uh, tuna, for your of, uh, local tuna processor, they are joining our program and we are auditing annually by the third party independently. Uh, now, they, recently, uh, we are working with. Uh, uh, Bureau of Veritas in Vietnam to audit annually for uh, FIP traceability course. And when we are designing and developing yet uh, traceability course, we also thinking about the, uh, the, the, the digitalization later on. So now that's called uh, can be digitalized. So you can see the finger here is uh, that's, uh, here are the, the, the structure of our tuna supply chain from the vessel until the final product when we are exporting to US or EU market. Next slide, please. Uh, beside that, we also think that one of the first point of the data from the white cat fisheries is come from fishermen. So that's why we are Firstly, we focus on the data from the fishermen at the, at the beginnings. So after we have the FIP code, we developed the um, electronic logbook since 2018. 
which we are uh, based exactly on our update circulars. And you may know that uh, we, we have just had the new officially launched. So all the legal systems have been changed since 2018. So we have to uh, uh, develop and revise our uh, electronic logbook based on our new circular, new legal system. And uh, for our e-logbook system, that most almost all of the KDEs was uh, auto uh, auto records, uh, like the location, the long, the last, the landing size, the the pork out, pork in pressure. Every most almost all of uh, KDEs was uh, record uh, automatically, uh, and our fishermen only input two information on that system is what kind of fish they are catching and how many kilos that also. So it's very simple and very friendly to our fishermen can use our e-logbook to provide the uh, white cast data for our tuna, uh, tuna fisheries. And also on this e-logbook, we, we mostly using the, the picture of the fish and we also uh, at the local name of the fish. You know, in Vietnam, one fish, one species, but may have several names in several areas of the fishing communities. That's why we are asking the local name for them for easy to use. And one of more strong niche of this e logbook system is it can be used without internet connection. It means that all the, all the data will be stored inside the uh, mobile device and just sent back to our domain, to our system when fishermen come back to the shore, when they are connected to the internet system. So fishermen just using the uh, smartphone or um, tablet to enter all sky of the guest data on that. Next slide, please. Uh, after we have the information from the fishermen, we have the coding of the traceabilities, and then we also de develop, we also digitalize a system or a application to digitalize all of the information from the fishing activity until the exporting activities. That's why in 2000, in, in 2018, we, uh, with the support from WWF Vietnam, we uh, developed an application uh, we call Vinastar, but uh, we base exactly on the ZDST guidelines version one point zero. Thus, we will digitalize all of the KDEs requested by the ZDST guidelines and collect in the one system. And you see that three pictures, the picture on the right hand side here, you see is of the is of the lost uh, of tuna product. They have the QR code here. So in this QR code, we are designing that it can access openly. You can use any kind of the application, can, can scan the QR code, and then you can read the information from this QR code. Uh, all the information from the catching until the processing and exporting. Next slide. Uh, another activity also like to share to you all is that uh, we also uh, uh, cooperate with the seed desk and UAID Ocean. Uh, here we have uh, we have Mr. John Park and also Mr. Farid that already support us to cooperate with to cooperate with the SIP deck as the technical support to, to pilot the uh, EACDS, is Electronic ASEAN Cash Documentation Scheme. So yes, uh, yes model we are pilot in Binh province for the uh, Persian fishery. Uh, Persian fishery uh, with the target species is Kipzak and for our canary uh, fishery. Uh, Based on the ECDS uh, application, we working with uh, uh, SIPDEC and UAID Ocean 
to to modify to customize to be the Vietnamese version and you see the picture at the end is the a Vietnamese version of the ECDS with the language is Vietnamese of course and the procedures also based exactly on our regulation in circular 21 and circular 13 in 2018 from the Vietnam government. So in the beginning, the ECDS is something general for all the ASEAN member states. But after that, with support from CIPDEX and working with us, we customize that, we modify that to be suitable with the Vietnam condition, with the Vietnam situation, and suitable with the Vietnam procedure under our regulation. Uh, and also under this uh, model, all of the process of the traceability, we are digitalizing this, even the uh, signature. The signature from authorities, signature from fishing park, signature, even the signature from fishermen and also from the processor. All of that we are collected and integrated in the system and it can generate automatically. Next slide, please. And the last activity that we also cooperate with uh, MCDs, uh, we also are doing the pilot, uh, we call it, the, it is ECDTs. Uh, ECDT is uh, electronic gas documentation and traceability. This model we are pilot in Binden province and is led by MCD. Uh, however, Vinatuna also play a supporting role on this activity and now we are still uh, developing more for the guidelines, uh, national guidelines for the digitalization for our uh, uh, fishery information. And under this uh, ECDTs, uh, MCD using the uh, attack that attack at the tail of the tuna to, to tracking, to monitoring every indiv individual tunas. And this, this system from ECDT can connect directly to the national VMS system. So that all of our system play a supporting role and connect it to the government system so that our data, our database can be recognized, can be um, uh, um, certified by our gov government as well. This, this question, I think that uh, many, uh, many participants already asked uh, our first and second speaker that how, how is the, the ownership of data here? So in, in, case of our, in case of Vietnam, we are placed a supporting role and all of our system is connected to the government system. So that is some, uh, uh, some story that I would like to share to you all. And I think that is the last slide. And okay. happy to share with you more detail on that and uh, hope to have uh, some questions from you all. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Howe. So we are now opening up for questions. So you could leave them in the chat or you could just ask. Oh, we have a question from Dr. Nora to Juliet. She asks, perhaps instead of data centralization, what is needed is interlinked data or access to data, just like university library can search and access materials from libraries all over the world. Oh, yeah, sorry, I, 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 th I think like there's two different types of data that to which we need access. One is about like the actual data that is being collected and that could be publicly accessed and that, for example, like national statistics. But what my feeling like, so I have this European background where absolutely all fisheries data are public access. When, when I needed to do data like stock, stock assessments, it was pretty easy. Um, mm -hmm. And then I arrived in Asia and things were different. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> yes. that's, that's one thing, definitely. I feel like governments need to work together to mm -hmm. have these like public uh, data access. Another point is about the information and the data on who is working on what. Mm -hmm. and, and for this, I think maybe like, uh, you know, a comprehensive website that would like uh, inform and have the, the, um, 
the main contact person and, and the main uh, organizations that work on different uh, topics would be uh, useful. Actually, I'm, I know Thomas uh, Reuters Foundation is working on some, some project that is similar to that. So that's interesting. I, I will follow up on that. Um, and I think some initiatives have been done, for example, by um, small scale fisheries uh, initiative projects where they have a map and you can like have contact people and you can have access to them. Uh, but I feel like we need something like this in, in the social areas in fisheries, mm -hmm. uh, because that's where I feel like many people are, are working on similar topics and, and we should have all uh, initiatives come together. So on this note, I think it's a good thing to know for our colleagues at Sufia TS project, maybe down the line, there could be a directory of um, key stakeholders in the fishery space, especially with the private sector, like, you know, guest speakers today and what they're working on. But also I want to highlight that Sufia LCD did a private sector landscape assessment that mapped out the key public private sector multi-stakeholder initiatives. And it's a start towards that as well. I'll share the link to the reports later. Oh, we got more questions. So John has asked Mr. Howe a question. Have ECDT data that was used by Vina Tuna to document, monitor, and analyze and suspect IUU fishing operations within the Vietnam EZZ water as observed by participating Vietnam vessels? <laughs> yes, thank you, Mr. John Park. Um, Actually, the data from each CDT is connected to the uh, national VMS system, as I mentioned in my uh, uh, presentation. And Vinatuna also have the account to access that data. In Vietnam, not all the data is uh, public publicly for everyone, but public for author authorities and public for some in charge person can log in and can, can guess, can access that data. So now is the ECDT system is connected directly to the VMS, national VMS system. And that's so that we can monitor, we can see where is that, where is that uh, fishing vessel, they are still uh, uh, go out for fishing or they are park, park, parking in the, in the port. And we also monitor that special for any, any time, anywhere that uh, we need. And any time that they are going out for, for fishing, so they have to repost every two hours to the national VMS system. Thank you. So I, I hope that, you know, down the line, ASEAN could host uh, like at least an updated statistics like the EU version of what Julia was um, talking about in terms of fishery data. I think currently CFDEC does one, but it's a little bit out of date based on our research. Ah, and we have a question. Oh, whoops, somebody has a question. Yes, uh, I did ask this before in okay. the session, but it, I was reminded again to ask it because there's a lot of talk about um, traceability. But what I'm hearing does not include the consumer, the end user. And I was wondering what the uh, uh, opinion or the uh, plans of the speakers are with regards to uh, providing this transparency of the supply chain all the way to the consumer. Because it's very important in building the trust between the industry and the, uh, and the fishermen as well to the level of the fishermen. Uh, to the public, the general public, and and uh, some something gets lost for some reason. With I've I've tried so many different, I've been involved with so many different types of traceability tools, and for some reason, something gets lost from the point of, say, it gets to the processor, and then from the processor, it might get to the buyer, uh, it might get to the consumer. I mean, there are some gaps still right now, and I'm not sure whether that's a lack of information or that's, uh, uh, we're hoping it's not suppression of information because uh, the consumer has a right to know. Uh, so it's a question for all the speak uh, speakers. Thank you, Sally. So I leave it open to all guest speakers. Who wants to tackle this one? <laughs> 
Uh, I think I may have some response first. Uh, okay. Uh, Mr. Charlie, that you are right. The final consumer is the 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 most important that we should do to get to, right? So they they have the right to accept information. Yeah, you, you are right. And on our case, for every tuna product, we have a small QR code on the on the um, on the package uh, on the on the label, mm. so that the final can, consumer can scan that QR code, and it will provide a website link. And on that website link, final consumer can read any information about that product, like who who caught that, where were that fishing, uh, when was fishing, and by what matters, handline or, or person, something. So most of the key DE, most of the key data element, we already upload on that QR code by a website link. So easily to access that information by any uh, software, any mobile phone can scan the QR code. We are designed openly. Thank you, Mr. Ha. Any other guest speakers wanted to highlight? Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask also that uh, I, I wanted to share also is uh, we are also implementing the same as Mr. Howe. We have our market uh, We also have a QR code that has the, the all the information from the catch up to the processing up to the market. So uh, that's the whole uh, trace AI system. So as I mentioned earlier also that the gap, uh, I agree with Ma'am Sally that the gap happens when they transport or on the logistics side when they, 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 uh, the, there's the processor already uh, uh, not having the information or not having the uh, transfer, the transfer of information to them and how they can transfer it also to the end user. But we, uh, on our system, we already have addressed it. That's why uh, we have a marketplace also where uh, buyers can register and pu uh, put up their stocks. And once that, that, that stock is sold, uh, the end user can also scan the QR code attached to that label. Uh, and find out where the origin of the tuna and who's the, the fisherman or the one registered to catch the fish. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have a, a little comment on this as well. Um, sure. I just feel like it's one of the easiest way to, to justify like uh, traceability is whenever the processing plant is actually sourcing from only from farms that all have the same level of sustainability. Um, and most of the time, this is not the case, right? So mm -hmm. I think the problem we're facing is when the processing plant is sourcing from farms that have different level of sustainability, and then that's where the information can get lost, specifically mm -hmm. for, well, I think it's very different from tuna, but like, for example, for shrimps, the problem is when they start to mix boxes, mm -hmm. and then, that, then all of a sudden the information gets lost. Um, which means maybe the, you have a final QR code, maybe the consumer can have all the information, but it might not be true. And I think at, there's a point, there's a limitation to what technology can do. And there's a moment where we need to have an audit. We need to have people on the ground doing this control in, in random boxes to make sure there's no anti antibiotics being used. So, so I feel like for some case, we need to, to keep in mind that there are limitations. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Juliet. Very important point. Uh, I see that actually Mr. Farid Marouf of Sufia TS asked a question to Mr. Farid from Aruna in the chat about expanding Aruna's initiatives to Southeast Asia. And yes, Mr. Farid did confirm that Aruna is looking to expand, that's good news, uh, into other countries in Southeast Asia, looking for partners. Because I, yeah. I, you know, working with CFDEC these past two years, I, I verified that the many people saw this need for similar uh, initiative in their countries, yeah. especially in the access yeah. to finance. 
Okay. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we are open uh, if there are any participants here who want to have more discussion with us. Thank you, Ma. Yeah. Yes, uh, we could, you know, I could call late if you need uh, Mr. Ferd's contact and I will share. But again, like this recording will be online. All the presentation PDFs will also be uploaded to Sufia page in the upcoming months. And I think, yeah, just, just send us an email if you need to connect with anybody. I will be happy to connect you to the guest speakers. Okay, we still have about 40 men left. Any other questions? I think we have mom a question from mom Nora. Mom. Okay, yes, I did miss one. Yeah, go ahead, Joey. Yeah, mom Nora uh, says that um, thank you, Mr. Howe, for the presentation. I'm wondering if your code also includes information if the fishery is sustainable, a la MSC, etc., certification. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, Actually, you're right. Uh, our tuna fishery also uh, will be will be uh, will come to the uh, full assessment for MSC soon. So that's one also one of the points that we are already thinking to that. And on our, on our QR code, uh, I would like to say that it's quite open to add any more other information, add any more other. Uh, key data element that we would like to urge. So hmm. actually you, you know that one QR code also can, can contain many, many, uh, uh, many information, right? Hmm. So we can urge um, any, any other information as at Winish, I think. Thank you. Yes, so I wanted to emphasize this is why it's so important to do regular stakeholder consultations to get the feedback for um, traceability improvement. I think this is one of the key learnings from, from the PSLA research as well. And also, I think it's also good to always educate the consumer group, the general public about traceability because there's so many systems and different countries testing out different equipments and there's a lot of confusion and basically too much information overload that sometimes also members of the general public and the consumer do have not a good understanding of what it is they're looking at through scanning the QR code and how does it link to the bigger picture. So I, I hope that maybe in the future, future project could also do an awareness campaign, just like Julia was saying, the social behavior type of messaging that really brings in the consumer element to this traceability. Uh, discussion. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Actually, I would like to add some more point that uh, at uh, Pima Church mentioned that we have many uh, many requirement from many other uh, other market, right? And this market they may have different requirements, and how we can add up. The lesson learned from our case, we are working very closely with the international buyer. The buyer, they are know exactly what they want or what their government want for our traceability bubbles. So for example, if we are export our tuna to US and US government have the new regulation uh, uh, at the US at IMP, for example. So, the U.S. importer, they are the most understanding on that regulation. So if we are engaged them to going with us, they will guide us how to go or how we can, how we can cooperate together to adapt with that regulation. Mm. Or if we are exporting to EU, we're also working with the EU buyer and they, they will guide us how, how we should go. And something, even even something is conflict. First, I, I give one simple example that, for example, we when we are doing the traceability purpose for 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 dolphin safe bubbles, mm. we have the dolphin safe cert certification, and EU market they base on an NGO is the EII organization, but the US market they asking from a government agency is the NOAA and OAA. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. So something may be different. So we have to work very closely with our buyer. They will guys, oh, this guy, they are 
uh, asking yes, uh, another regulator and they are asking that. So we will combine or we will add up that regulation. That's, I think that is one of the uh, things that we need to focus on our buyer. Yes, I think that's a very important point. I think in recent years, we see the demand to, for improved performance that could lead to a lot of policy and regulatory changes that, you know, if you're exporting to multiple markets, all of these I mean, different standards and requirements all have to be met. Very good point. And actually, Mr. Ha, follow-up questions on that. So when you're complying to the export requirements beyond working with your, um, you know, importer, exporter group, do you work with any, oh, you said like for the US, you would work with government agencies, but is there any other NGOs involved as well? Yes, of course. Um, actually, we, uh, beside the, um, the international buyer, we also work with the uh, government agency from mm -hmm. US and also some other NGOs from US and from EU as well. Okay. Like, uh, we have very good uh, uh, relationship with the uh, EII, uh, Earth and Island Institute mm. to, to how to train our fishermen to protect dolphin, for example, like that. Mm -hmm. And on that regulation, they, they also uh, have strong requirement on traceability as well to separate the safe dolphin and unsafe dolphin products, so, for okay. example. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And ma'am, can I just ask yes. a follow-up question? Yes, on of that? course. Uh, it has to do with, it just reminded me of how do you verify that the data you have is trustworthy, data integrity? Because that's very, very important for the traceability if you, we're transmitting this throughout the supply chain. And if there is anything there that is false news, fake news, whatever you call it, has not been verified, then, I mean, the whole thing collapses, right? So how do we ensure that the integrity at all steps in order to get the trust um, and credibility? Okay, well, I get, let guest speaker think on that. I'm going to add another question to that because it's related. Uh, Arlene's also added, how does your traceability systems deal with the human welfare issues? So combine that together with data integrity and data inter integrity. Oh, I can't speak. <laughs> and then the human welfare key data elements. So, okay, I open the floor to guest speakers. <laughs> Anybody want to go first? Maybe I can answer on the part on um, how do we verify information. Hmm. So one, because we've had like both experiences, like like of conducting the survey ourselves, going on the ground and, you know, being with the farmers. And we've also had the experience of using um, technology tools to collect data. So where we don't actually go on the ground, we have someone there who's around the farmers and support them for the technology. And then we analyze the data from our office. And one thing we notice is that it's very hard to actually really verify data when you're far away. Of course, you can do algorithms. We've built algorithms that would like, uh, you know, highlight, for example, if you have like a big production and you have like, a small number of employers at a certain ratio, then we have a red flag because we think maybe there's like some hidden labor issues uh, on, on this specific farm and you can like highlight certain things. But, but we really found limitation and at a point we realized that for some projects where we had to have the final proofs, we had to go on the field, we had to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, we discovered with, with certain um, farms where there were like really bad uh, living conditions for migrant workers and we couldn't have known that just with surveys and just with like in entry in the mobile application we had to be there and we had to see it with our own eyes so uh, i i would say that you know it's kind of like what's happening with the audit process where mm -hmm. uh, if you have many farms you do a sampling and you decide okay on this number of farms we're gonna verify it ourselves um and i for now, um, I don't see anything that can really, uh, you know, get this level of scrutiny and security. 
But then I guess all these projects where we put cameras on the boats maybe mm. are prom promising because then when, if you have a camera, you can see a lot of things. Now I, I, don't, I don't realize how much is the acceptance for fishermen. Having a camera on board is very intrusive. Um, I have not in on some aquaculture farms in Thailand when they want to sell to Tesco, they also have to do that to have a camera on the farm. Um, but it's definitely intrusive. So there's like, what what's the balance between like mm. how much you want to in intrude in people's personal life and how much you want to verify the data? Yes, very good point, Julia. Thank you. Guest speakers want to join? Yeah. Uh, Chair? I just want to add also. Uh, I agree with uh, Julia that uh, it's hard to do the validation of the real data being inputted or how it is on the ground. And yeah, we implement the same thing. We hire field technician to do the data gathering for, for our uh, system right now. But we also, me, I really have this, I ask my uh, technical team or the field technical team uh, to, to check on the environment, to send me to have a report on the environment, like how is the area look, looks like, where is the place that they put all those catch and also it's part of their daily activity. So, and also uh, I also ask them to uh, kind of document the process on how they uh, interact with fishermen and other actors. So uh, we will know how to really uh, mitigate uh, constraint on the ground. So uh, as we see, uh, yeah, it, it's working on our side and uh, we're looking at really, uh, I had issues before that uh, taking pictures of other fishermen is somewhat, uh, needs permission and all, but we already uh, uh, give them a letter before we initially register them in our system. So uh, uh, they have this acceptance letter that we will be gathering pictures and information uh, throughout their activities. So I think, uh, yes, it's really hard in monitoring mm -hmm. and there's a resistance and it feels like uh, uh, or kind of policing them, but uh, maybe uh, talking to them on a level that uh, they are comfortable is one validation also on how we approach the ground uh, people or the fishermen and see their welfare. So yeah, that's how we do it. Okay, thank you, Cherry. Yeah, uh, from from my segment, uh, I can add another uh, answer about that. So yeah. Uh, I'm agree with the previous uh, uh, answer about how we put the people on the ground. So this way for Aruna itself, we put uh, the local heroes as the one that uh, do the data collection and do the um, the the uh, activity, the, com uh, the activity with the community. Another point that we also built is, is the internal audit system. Uh, in Aruna, we do the internal audit system that validate on every region. Uh, we do the like in quarterly basis uh, to, to check if their uh, the the standard already implemented by our local heroes and our uh, and the fishermen itself. Uh, that's the one thing. And uh, from that, another point that we want to validate is we register for the certification. Now that's what we are working on with our sustainability team. We want to register from MSC and another certification that can validate our traceability procedure and sustainability procedure. And also from our traceability system, we currently we collect the livelihood, the, the income level of our fisherman partner. Uh, we are working with the academic institution in Indonesia. Uh, there is a university called University of Indonesia that do the impact report uh, for us. Uh, we just finished the, the 2021 uh, impact report that showing the impact of Aruna, like the income level, uh, how much uh, the price increase and how much the level of income increase for our fisherman partner and also the financial iteration impact and technology, uh, technology iteration impact. So the other data that I can share, like uh, four of 10 uh, fishermen that join with Aruna now, they have a bank account. If you see, they didn't have bank account, now they have bank account. And another thing like the increment of the uh, pricing uh, in several commodity, the, the price can, can uh, increase up to 50%. And also the income of the fishermen 
in in the location that uh, uh, this uh, academic institution do the research is that the income in, is increased like uh, two times. So there's there's several insight that we can sell later. But but just the thing that we also monitor not only the movement of the products but also the livelihood of our fisherman partner because the one of the most important element for us is the uh, fisherman and 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 fish farmer partner that that become the the frontliner uh, to produce the uh, fish. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think in light of that, we have about five minutes left to the end of the session. Does anybody have any last minute urgent question? <laughs> if not, then I will, I will just close the session here. But before we go, I wanted to share the key links to Sophia's page, the post-session survey. We always welcome your feedback for our improvement. And then also I would like to ask for a group photo if if you don't mind. And uh, Kunsumita, can you please take a quick photo? Okay. Last for me. Last one. Okay. Oh, last one. <laughs> you didn't count, so I didn't know. <clears throat> okay. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So, if anybody Thanks. has any questions, okay. just contact me. And again, all the recordings will be up soon on our webpage, and the link has just been shared by Kun Smita. It's okay if your camera is not working. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you again. You. Yeah, Thank, Thank you, you. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Kunbrai, I think you could stop recording.